Ouvinte espectador gregário, Nicolas Hessler e eu tivemos em Londres no final do ano passado e nasceu, primeiro, uma experiência fantástica que nós dois tivemos e gravamos um monte de coisa. É, eu encontrei com vários ídolos e conhecemos uma pessoa genial, que foi o Matteo Cassina, que uh, é o empresário, o CEO do Ruler Live. Uh, graças àquele programa, a gente fez um programa com o Simon Moulstrom, uh, da Rafa, que foi o nosso especial de Natal. E aí vale dividir com vocês, é, porque tem uma surpresa no final desse programa, Nicolas, quem é o Mateu? Então, o Mateu, primeiro, teve o privilégio de nascer nas margens do Lago de Como, na Itália, é, que só aí já é covardia. Né? É, nascer num lugar lindo daquele e briga-se do giro, que é a prova mais dura do mundo, no lugar mais lindo do mundo, e o Lago de Como com certeza está nessa lista. Depois disso, ele fez uma carreira é, executiva no ramo financeiro, morando em Buenos Aires, Paris, Frankfurt, Londres. E, nesse momento, ele estava na Saxobank, que patrocinava a equipe Saxobank de ciclismo e talvez fez uma conexão com ele que a gente vai conversar mais. Mas, antes de colocar ele na roda, dizer o seguinte, o Mateu, uh, dessa paixão antiga, foi um dos primeiros investidores na Zwift, uh, em 92, comprou uma Passone para ele, que é uma bicicleta de sonho de titânio é, consagrada nos anos 80. E a gente já teve aqui com o sócio dele, que também chama Mateu, falando sobre a Passone, um programa que eu recomendo que você ouça. Em 2011, ele começou a investir na Passone, que era um dos melhores fabricantes de titânio da Europa, inclusive fazendo é, bicicletas com outras pinturas para vários ciclistas do, do World Tour, do Pro Tour. 2016, uma marca muito interessante de vestuário, acho meio talvez uma das primeiras do look mais clean, de uma coisa mais elegante e menos colorida, que foi fundada em 2011 por um pessoal com uma super experiência de design. Em 2017, a Ruler, que inclusive é uma inspiração para nós fazermos agregário, assim, é, a qualidade editorial, a qualidade fotográfica, visual da Ruler, uh, é uma experiência que você só encontra referências em grandes revistas consagradas de moda. E ela foi fundada junto com o movimento da Rafa em 2008. E em 2020, o Matheus resolveu organizar todas as associações num grupo e está focando a energia dele, e é isso que a gente vai conversar aqui, essa é a conexão, num grupo que tem a Passone como bicicleta de titânio de bicicleta de sonho, mas também acessível com outras opções. A Shmei, como uma confecção que liderou uma linha mais clean lá desde 2011. E a Ruler, que tem a revista e tem a Fran. Então, Nicolas, vamos convidar aqui e aí vamos colocar é, no outro idioma, porque o Mateu, apesar de ter morado na Argentina, é, mas morando em vários lugares do mundo, eu acho que ele entende o português mas talvez ele tenha juízo de não se aventurar tanto no Portunhol. Uh, Matheus Cassina, bem-vindo aqui, mas antes, Nicolas, é, trazendo você para a roda. Claro. Eu acho que lembrar também, dentro dessa conexão, né, Álvaro, como são os encontros do destino. Quando a gente estava lá em Londres, é, durante o Roller Cycling Show, é, a gente conhecia o nome do Matheus, mas não tinha acesso a ele. E graças a dois ouvintes nossos, né, do Gregário, o Alain e a, e a Renata, e você encontrou com eles na, na fila da, da Ruler, não me lembro se era para pegar um, um autógrafo com o próprio Simon, Simon Motram, ou como foi a, a história, e eles falam, não, nós somos super amigos do Matheus, vamos aqui, a gente te introduz, e daí começou uma conversa, e a raiz desse podcast, e a raiz de mais coisas que estão por vir, né, de mais é, colados e coisas entre Gregário e Juler. Então, fazer essa conexão também, né, a, a você aí que nos escuta, agradece como o mundo do ciclismo é pequeno e podem conectar, conectar coisas. Mateu, bem-vindo. So I'm so happy to be here and I'm very happy to follow the conversation and understand everything, you know, so all my time watching uh, Brazilian TV and surfing in Praia do Rosa, was uh, well spent. 
<laughs> I, I I follow. I see that you follow everything that we introduce it. You know everything from Alan and uh, and Renata. The way we actually met each other. Uh, as as a matter of question, your mother tongue is Italian. Italian, for, yeah. for sure. Uh, so I'm a bit Italian confused with my identity right now because I left Italy when I was in my twenties. So I've been away for thirty years now. So at some point I felt a very Argentinian. Then uh, I felt a bit German. Then I married a French wife. We married in Sweden. Uh, and now I've been in London for over 20 years. And so I, I'm a foreigner in London. I, I'm a foreigner in Lake Como. And I'm a bit lost. <laughs> lost in translation, as uh, Bill Murray, the uh, great uh, But Matteo, uh, having been born in uh, Lago Como, uh, at the north of Italy, how much uh, there was a bicycle, a cycling industry, a cycling, cycling in your blood uh, with the, the past of being Como on your childhood? I mean, the bicycle was, uh, I mean, it's really funny, you know, because I talk about Italy, about things that I experienced 25 years ago, you know, and people, and I, when I talk to my friends anywhere else around the world, I say, in Italy, this is what we do. And then my friends, Italians, say, but this is what you did 30 years ago. So 30 years ago, we would go to school on our bicycle when we were five years old. You know, we could uh, leave at uh, seven o'clock in the morning. Traffic was very different. Our parents were not as apprehensive. And so I started going to school when I was five with my bicycle. And my father was one of seven boys. Uh, everyone had a bicycle. Most of them had two or three kids with bicycles. Uh, we all had a flat in the Alps uh, up this Plugenplatz and we spent our life, uh, you know, bicycle was uh, the BMX and commuting and going to school and uh, the first mountain bikes and uh, race bikes. It's like we, we were on bicycle all the time and everyone knew how to ride a bike. Yeah, but if I may ask, Obviously, in Italy, the passion for the Giro and everything, you know what professional cycling is. But when did the bicycle become part of your business life? Being that through sponsoring professional teams or being that through actually owning business in the bike industry? So I believe I was uh, 11 years old. Uh, and uh, I went back to my parents and I said, one day I will make bicycles. You know, I had my BMX and I would, you know, work with my tools. I had a nice box for Christmas where I would uh, change my tires, change the chain. Uh, and, you know, and some people grow up wanting to be fireman or ballerina. And I said, I will make bicycles. And it's something that I forgot for a number of years. Then I went to university. I was a rower. I wanted to go to the Barcelona Olympics in 92. And uh, I was uh, very strong as a rower, as an athlete. And cycling, if you're a strong rower, you're a strong cyclist. You know, maybe not the best climber in the world. And uh, when I met my uncle in, uh, uh, on the Maloya Pass, going to St. Moritz with the training camp, uh, I saw a Passoni and I went back to my dad and I said, I would like a Passoni. You know, I would like that bicycle of my dreams. It's wonderful. I really want one. And then it took me 20 years where I got, uh, you know, I finished university, I worked for, you know, international companies, I traveled the world, and I forgot my entrepreneurial uh, background. You know, my family, everyone had a small shop or was a doctor or an architect. No one worked for corporations. You know, everyone runs their own business. And then uh, one day when I was 40, my wife said, what would you like for your birthday? And I said, I would like a Passoni that my dad did not buy me when I was 22. And it was a very good lesson, you know, to say, you know, one day you will be able to afford it yourself. And then when I met Silvia Passoni, Luca Passoni just passed away. And, and I said, you know what? I wanted to make bicycle. This is my opportunity. And within 48 hours, we signed the agreement and I bought uh, the majority of Passoni. So for me, it's uh, it was in me for many, many years. And really when I... Uh, met Sylvia, I said, but this is really what I want to, I want to own it, you know, and uh, and I think I'm more of a fetishist for the object and for the bike that always lived in my bedroom. I have many bikes in my in my house, 
rather than being obsessed about doing uh, six hours a day, winter and summer. Uh, I'm not that kind of cyclist. So you are too amateur, as no, I am. I've done, I've done, I've done uh, a lot of stuff. I've done a week in the Alps, uh, uh, 150 kilometers a day. Uh, I've done one race in my life that I won, just one, <laughs> when I was a mm. rower. It was a, a mountain bike race, uh, not very high caliber. Uh, so sometimes I go for a week and I ride every day. But it's... I'm more of a rower than a cyclist. You know, I shouldn't say this on a cycling podcast, but I really love <laughs> rowing on, on the Thames on my you own. Should, my everybody has a, a talent, Matteo, and you, you, you know that by now. And some are built to lead, some are built to deal with people, some are built to deal with machines, with numbers, some are built to win um, races. But the, the beauty of things is... Is finding this balance between uh, what you do well and what uh, what you actually enjoy doing. Because maybe it's not because only you are good at one thing that you should be doing that. Maybe you enjoy more other sides. So not at all. Uh, we have plenty of uh, good cyclists or, or good uh, people who actually love something else. And I actually make I think makes you. It's important to find those hobbies and things that you really like in life to to counterbalance. And there's an elegance that growing and bicycle uh, they have in common. The muscles are somehow uh, similar. Uh, I personally, when I'm traveling, uh, I prefer doing rowing machines uh, when I'm in the gym and stuff like that. But getting back to Passoni, uh, how was your experience on riding uh, Sumizura, a made-to-measure bike, when you had at your 40th anniversary? Uh, what is different between having a bicycle that's made in Asia uh, on mass production versus a bicycle that's specially made for you? And how did you feel the first time you, you rode it? Yeah, so I, I think it's important to talk about uh, uh, bike fitting and frame building. You know, and so when you do a bike fit, uh, you know, and Nicholas knows it very well, and, and I'm sure you do as well, and many of our listeners. Uh, you end up having a, a drawing that says this is where your feet needs to be, this is where your saddle and this is where your head needs to be. It's a triangle. That's your position. No? And the ideal position doesn't exist because the reality is to go very, very fast. You need to be with your back flat and you see the pros and it's super uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So comfort and performance are, are fighting with each other. You know, you can be very comfortable when you go on a Dutch bike straight like this with a handlebar here you're very comfortable mm -hmm. you can do 200 kilometers and then if you want to do 200 kilometers very fast then you become very uncomfortable so there is an element of the process of designing your bike that has to do with a journey on i am five kilos too heavy i lost my flexibility i'm getting a bike made for me do i want to make it sitting like this or do i want to force myself and six months from now a bicycle will come that we have a position which is slightly different. No? And uh, when you buy a stock bike, changing the stem and moving the saddle, you can find exactly the same position. And so the position is not that you cannot find the same position on a stock bike, but the key difference with the made to measure bike is that you can play with every other parameter. So you can play with the length of the rear triangle that will give you uh, a more subtle you know, ride and it will be, give you a bit more flexibility. You can change uh, the angle of the head tube, you can change the rake of the fork, you can change the sloping, you can change uh, the height of the bottom bracket and so the, the size and the dimension of the tubing according to how stiff you want it or how comfortable you want it. And all of that will make a very, very different uh, ride, you know, and, uh, and understanding what you want. You know, I now built probably 15 Passoni for myself, you know, and every time I build one, I change it. You know, it's like, sign. let's move this by two millimeters, let's change this. And I see the difference. And I think there's another element that for me is super important is my bike is unique and it's made for me. You know, whether the length of the rear triangle 20 millimeters longer or shorter made a real difference or not, it makes a difference to me. You know, when I go and mm -hmm. ride it and I go and uh, climb the Stelvio, I'm on something which has been done for me 
that I will never sell, that I enjoy massively and that I will pass on to my children and I will hang on my uh, in my garage or in my living room for many years to come. You know, so for me, the, the, the process is really how you go through the process of choosing the design, the components, the coloring, the geometry, the stiffness, and then how do you get fitter so that you deserve to ride on a bicycle like that? You know, what's good is that we are not luxury item and people buy it and put it on the wall. People buy it and use it, you know, and I think it's super important to then want to ride more because the process was uh, more complex. Literally, it's like it is your bike. It is not, uh, you didn't fit into that bike. We could do an analogy, like you can buy a house uh, or an apartment, or you can build your house and your apartment. And in the end, when you build a house, when you build something, it's, mm, it has your DNA there. It's something that you want. I want this door here, not there. Uh, I want this top two, but this length. I, I like this head tube angle. I like... Mm, the bottom bracket like that, stiffness. And I guess we've all have felt at some point, even with stock bikes, that we can have plenty of good bikes, but there are some that we just feel like one with the bike and the others say, ah, the bike is good, but eh. although the position, the measurements, everything theoretically is the same on the spreadsheet, but you just don't feel the same on the bike. Uh, it's not, you are not one with the bike. Uh, and that's the difference on a on a handmade one, right? You can really make your bike. I agree hundred percent. You know, and I think one of the passion for for bicycles and design for me comes from the failed career, you know, of uh, being an architect. You know, and I think I have a few friends that got houses built, and they don't want to have anything to do with it. And they say, I have uh, the best architect in the world and I'm going to build an amazing house. And it breaks my heart. It's like, yeah, but it's it's not your house. You know, it's like, if you do not participate in the process, it's a shame. You know, then you go, like, I go to a hotel, you know. I want my house to mm -hmm. have uh, a door from the bathroom that goes into my garage. You know, it's like, you know, you just do stuff that is uh, yours and, uh, and it's very different, you know. It has your signature. Talk here. That's... Talk about being different. What called your attention on Ashmei? Uh, and Ashmei was one of the first that uh, needed a more clean design, uh, a more elegant design uh, on uh, cycling clothing. And what called your attention back on uh, 2015, 2016 for you to so invest was, and help uh, manage? I was working for Saxo Bank and uh, you know, running the bank, but also running uh, the cycling team as a sponsor, you know, using it, the sponsorship, you know, but really I was the reference within the organization for the cycling team. And we invited Alberto Contador to Ruler Live. Uh, mm -hmm. And at that event, uh, Ashmei came to exhibit at Ruler Live. And a friend of mine grabbed me and said, you know, look at this. They're launching this uh, new cycling collection uh and they're raising capital would you like to try the products you know and uh, and i maybe i made some mistake i made a number of mistakes in my life you know but i think the product is a very important component of the success of a company you know uh, but not the only component so i tried the product uh and i was overwhelmed you know the the founder of uh, the company spent 25 years you know from graduating to royal college of uh, fashion spent 25 years designing sport apparel for very technical uh, sports, you know, for uh, sailing, for going to the Everest, for windsurfing, for running, for outdoor in general. And he was very familiar with readability, uh, whether something is getting, you know, is scratching your nipples when you run, uh, odor, durability, stitching, and uh, he spent five years designing a cycling line because he was just a consultant to other brands creating product, including a consultant to Rafa for a number of years at the beginning of uh, the Rafa collection. And he wanted to create something, it's, it's not the right way of saying it, very expensive. You know, he was not worried about how much it costs to make something, but he said, I want the absolute best. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm, uh, very happy with the product 
what I discovered the hard way is the market is very competitive and the product is not sufficient. You know, the reality, you need a lot of marketing, you need a lot of luck, a lot of technology, you need a big budget to get the, the brand refreshed, you need to do sales, 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 sales all the time. Uh, and during the pandemic, when I took over the business, I decided to keep it going, keep on developing new product, but really focus on the media company to make the media company much stronger and then keep Ashme a niche product uh, for a number of years to come. You know, the reality is Merino is, if you try it, you don't go back, but mm -hmm. it's much easier to sell a, a plastic Lycra jersey that costs eight, uh, $10 to make for $150 because it has a nice brand, you know? Yeah. Let's say you, you are talking branding, basically finding uh doing the branding work that the company was still maybe missing and it's something that you came from the background from uh, all the companies you've worked with are you asking the question to me eh? yeah like uh, the, the idea of the brand finding a proper branding to to the company uh, and a, a position uh, where that the company belongs in the market. Yeah, maybe well, I'll, I'll tell you something else. You know, I worked for some of the most successful uh, organizations in the world. You know, I worked for Goldman Sachs, I worked for Citadel, for some of the best and most competitive businesses in the world, and I've done reasonably well. You know? So I, I was next to a thousand very smart people working very hard, and I ended up having a good career. You know? And then I bought Passoni, I bought Tashmei, and with a bit of arrogance, I said, you know what? I speak five languages. I travel the world. I sponsor the team. I know many pros. I, all of my friends are cyclists. It's going to be easy. You know, we do a ni nicer website. We do some social media. We create a data warehouse. And we do this and this and that. It's much harder than that. And in, uh, in uh, <laughs> small companies, what has happened in cycling especially and apparel, in the last few years is there are many companies losing a lot of money very well funded and refunded and refunded uh, and it's very difficult to compete with people that are a 40 50 percent discount all the time all the time all the time and at the end of the year they lost a million two million five million ten million in the hope that one day they might become very big or cease to exist or the founder ends up having two percent of his own company you know for me I have a grandfather that opened a shop and my father started running the shop and then my brother is in the shop and that business took 70, 80 years to grow. You know, it grows 10% a year, sometimes it doesn't. And I think this obsession of uh, the disposable economy of spending a lot of money, grow very fast, hire and fire, get the customer to buy a jersey for $150, but an hour later sell it to someone else for 50 then throwing away some of the stock you've done, it just for me breaks my heart. So when you think about sustainability, for me, you know, the fashion industry will become sustainable because all the fabric will be sustainable. The, the value chain will recycle the products. But I think what's not sustainable is capitalism in the way that we operate it. You know? So for me, I want to run a conscious, stable business whereby I want every month to pay my suppliers I want every month to pay my uh, employees. I want every time I deliver a jersey to a client for $100, that the next customer is also spending $100 instead of sending it to Alvaro for $170 and Nicolas comes through the shop tomorrow morning and you can buy it for $50. Oh, that's mm -hmm. just, it's not right. But then it's sometimes you need to fight with it. You know? And so somehow, uh, well, uh, I, for Passonian uh, Ruler, I have it figured out and I think we've grown very well and I think we have very good businesses and sound. For Ashmei, I'm still a bit lost on what does it need? What do we need to do? It's, it's, it's true that the clothing industry right now, when you look worldwide, uh, from 10 years to now, so many brands have came into the market. Uh, and really niching at this minimalistic uh, top quality or selling it at least and you see that worldwide go you know, have us so now you have 
Q36, uh, Castelli, support for somehow, although slightly less uh, niche oriented, but go big in Spain. It's it, indeed, it, it's been far. And as a consumer, I must say, uh, I look at all that and I say, is really that many people buying that many bike clothing? The market is, uh, is, is much smaller than what uh, those investors and those brands uh, wanted it to be. Uh, and it's a problem. I think the there are some companies that are makers. You know, they own a factory. They've always made for others. Uh, and they, they work very well. And they might be small and they're very profitable. Uh, I think the one thing that happened is when Rafa started and said, we do direct to consumer, and they understood the power of the web, to have mm -hmm. a good brand and product, some good ambassadors, and a website allowed you to have a global company. So, you know, they could sell and send a, a jersey to Korea and then receive it back. And it was fine. And it was a good business. No? With the pandemic and with the digitalization and with the expectation of consumers, now what you have is in Spain, there are 3,000 bicycle shops with a Shopify platform with stock that they bought and they cannot actually pay the supplier for. So if you want to buy a helmet, white, in Barcelona, probably there are 25 shops with a Shopify platform with a digital strategy uh, and some money spent in Barcelona that will deliver you three helmets at 40% discount within an hour. And if you don't like them, they come and collect it at your house. And so this globalization, either you're Amazon and you really have warehouses everywhere and you take over. Otherwise, you know, the Wiggle and those big supermarkets globally with stock in one place don't exist anymore because you're now competing with 30,000 shops, all digitalized to be on top of Google, to be on Facebook above anyone else that spends money is becoming so, so incredibly expensive. And all the money is taken by Google, Facebook, Instagram, and it's just brutal. And uh, Matteo, let's talk about another subject, which is as challenging, which is media company, Rulaire, and uh, the Rulaire live show. Uh, Rulaire was an inspiration for us to create Gregario uh, on the quality of editorial quality, uh, the photographic editorial part. Uh, I think it, it brings back a concept that has been misunderstood, which is luxury, not to the aspect of showing off on Instagram, but to the aspect of uh, the best quality that you can do. What brought your attention to participate and now be the, uh, the majority owner of uh, Rulaire on a, on, a, on a moment that print media had been suffering so much? and that there is less people that are valuing what a good uh, media is, what a good article, what a quality photograph uh, that you have the experience either on your uh, iPad or your, your physical edition. How, what attracted you to Rulaire and which are the challenges that your team is uh, looking to stay uh, with uh, a massive audience? So I'll, I'll start with the first uh, part of the question, which is uh, how I got involved. So I bought one of the, probably one of the first 10 Rafa jerseys that were ever produced, coincidentally. My wife bought it for me and I got to know Simon Motram where he had one employee. Uh, and Simon Motram created uh, Ruler and I subscribed to the issue one, which is now becoming a collector uh, issue. Um, and for the better part of 13 years, or they say for, for 10 years, I've been a subscriber of every single issue and I've read most of the articles and it made me a better, not cyclist, but a better, I know more cycling, you know, the culture of cycling, you know, which is not only racing, but it's cycling overall. Who are the producers? Who are the bespoke? Uh, how do people train? Uh, who are the athletes? What are the races, etc. And then 
when uh, I was running Saxo Bank and the sponsorship, Ruler helped us with some communication, some events, and some content. Uh, and as they were raising money, uh, I was asked to invest into PlaySport, into GCN, and also to invest in Ruler. And I prefer Ruler. I prefer the product, and uh, and I decided to invest in Ruler. And Ruler got stuck into the old media, you know, and it's got stuck into this loop of people are not buying magazines anymore, advertising in print is not uh, as big as before, uh, people at work get a bit frustrated, they don't get paid enough, they want to work less because they don't get paid enough, and it's, this, uh, it's very unhealthy, you know? And I started having mm-hmm. some board meeting where I started getting a bit annoyed on the opportunity for media. You know, as a reality, you have a super brand, you have people creating content, you have a physical magazine, you have a world that is evolving very fast, and you have Instagram, Facebook, you have newsletter automation, you have YouTube, you have podcast. There's so much you can do. You know, you can do TV broadcasting, a bit like what we're doing now, without having a mm-hmm. billion dollar TV license and you don't need to pay for it. You know, it's like you get free airtime and if your content is good, you get a million people to watch it. I don't think this is going to be watched by a million people, but let's, <laughs> let's see what happens. No? And so when I got involved, uh, and I was getting very frustrated. I said, you know, what's the future for this? You know, and as I left the bank, I said, you know, maybe instead of being frustrated and being on the other side of the table and say, you guys are not doing what you should be doing. He said, let me now sit on the other side of the table and see whether I can do it. No? And when I bought uh, a few hours later, we had the, the COVID uh, scare. It was really like the timing I signed. And if you I got oh. home in the evening and said, we have an issue. Within less than four weeks. Oh, God. We, Bad we, timing. We, eh? Yeah, it was crazy. We couldn't distribute the magazine in newsstand. The paper cost triple. The delivery of the magazine to subscriber was just not done because the post was delivering other stuff. Everyone was home. And you know the delivery system just got uh, collapsed. But yet, in that environment, coming from a completely different industry, I gained the authority to tell editors and everyone that was working in this industry, we need to do something different. You know, the reality, if we keep on doing what we're doing, we don't have a business, you guys don't have a salary, you're, you're working from home, you, you might not be able to find another job for the next two years. What do we do? What do we do? And so in less than uh, 18 months, we triple our uh, print subscribers. We saw mm-hmm. a lot of our competitors shutting down the print product. And I do believe that quality print still has a role to exist, but as a role to exist in a multimedia organization that has a community, an event, that has a podcast, that has the audio version of that magazine that you want to receive and collect, but you might want to read through your podcast in your car as you drive uh, to the office. Uh, and now we transform the organization really in a multimedia organization that publishes the magazine in Italian, in Spanish, in English. Very soon uh, for the Tour de France, we'll publish the first issue in French. Uh, we do social media in Chinese and we start to communicate it to the Chinese audience, which is growing very fast. And we do all of the you know, event, travel, uh, podcast, YouTube, uh, newsletter, uh, app for the, for listening to the content, etc. Yeah, in, in the end, I think a view on like uh, where media is going is that the information is still the same and has to be transmitted. But we, as media company, we have to find ways to provide that information everywhere and at any time and in any way the person wants to consume it. So be that through the printed version. Who doesn't love to, for example, you are in the airport doing nothing. You're probably going to sit hours on a plane and don't have a data coverage or whatever. Still, touching the paper is unique and, and seeing it and, and gives you a an unique experience. you got to be there. But for many, when you are in that super fast business road, going uh, commuting from here to there, you just don't have time to touch the paper. You want to listen it. Or the other users uh, through social media, whatever, and many ways that will still be found. Um, But 
it's definitely not easy to find that balance, right? How to provide that content uh, anywhere, anytime. Well, one comment is that uh, even though printed media had been suffering uh, in magazines and in newspaper and all the companies are uh, pivoting to change, the book industry has not been disrupted. Uh, this is something that amazes me, that the growth of audiobooks or the growth of ebooks uh, still is very marginal, under 20%. In the US, in Brazil, is like 5%. And it just brings me that the physical experience of having a book, of reading the book, uh, of the smell of paper, uh, it still has a lot of value. And maybe it's the one of the few medias that had not been disrupted by digital at this yet. Uh, and it amazes me because I'm a lover of uh, ebooks uh, because I, I, I love to, to read and to have a lot of things. And I buy a book, but not necessarily I have the time to read it. So with the Kindle, I have all the books with me all the time. But I'm an exception. Uh, so just to bring back that there is things about human behavior that are not rational. They are not, uh, it's, this is that. And uh, I think Ruler exemplifies, uh, I have been a subscriber of many magazines over 40 years of a cyclist. Uh, and uh, Ruler is one that inspired me and I always aspire to have the physical edition on my hand because the quality of paper, the, the, the quality of the design, of the, the diagramming, uh, the text uh, that is, rich but not tiring. Uh, I think that that sweet balance, and that's what I mean on the luxury, the luxury of something that is a high quality, not because of expensive to show off, uh, that, that inspires. And in some way is the reason that we're doing this podcast, not to share your profile with our audience uh, and having the privilege to have you here, a true uh, businessman using his talent and time for the cycling industry, but also that uh, we agreed to do uh, some collaboration together. That, uh, and if you can share with us uh, from your words, Matteo, uh, what uh, we have planned ahead. And this is, we are dating, we're not getting married. So we be, we're still independent companies, uh, but we, we have our first uh, dinner in London uh, in November. And now we decided to date. Uh, so if you could share uh, your global vision, as you said, then how much the relationship between uh, the Roulaire uh, print and also the show and uh, what Gregario brings to the picture? I think for me, what's really important is uh, I'll, I'll talk about the Roulaire a second, you know, and then I see how that uh, fits. You know, the, the physical uh, product it's always been everlasting, you know, an article on uh, um, the entrepreneurial journey of uh, a family. Fausto Pinarello is an article that we write, we publish on this month uh, publication, and then you read it three years from now and it's still relevant now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what's really important is when we look at uh, the content, as we cover pro cycling, you know, and as we cover uh, cycling overall, there are creating quality content is very expensive. Having the architecture to be able to support the app, the YouTube, to have the access to the uh, photo library, to be able to crop a video, etc., is also very expensive. And what we're trying to create is an organization that has a hub and spoke, you know, a local organization whereby you have global content and some of the content is generated in Italy by Campagnolo and we are in Vicenza with our editor, uh, the Italian editor. Some of it is generated in Italy through the Giro, some of it in France through the Tour. Uh, uh, and so we have people everywhere that create content, but that content needs to be universally relevant. So if we go to Spain and we talk about uh, uh, Indurain, any country in the world, we want to listen to that story. If we go to France yes. and we talk about the daughter of a rider 
who got depressed, almost committed suicide, was struggling with. It's a human story which is globally relevant. So for us, it's the theme is we seek stories that are universally relevant, that could be written anywhere, but then also uh, de deployed and read in any language anywhere in the world. No? And so the the reason why we created this organization where we acquired Volata in Spain, we launched Ruler Italia, we're launching Ruler France, and we want to collaborate with Gregario is first is to start learning from each other. You know, what are you doing better than us? What can we learn from you? And then having a global coverage where you, you add the language, the local knowledge, the creation of local stories that are globally relevant. And then eventually we get to a point where we share the cost of creating that the content we share the relationship with the advertiser that help us also uh, being in business. And we create a, a collaboration whereby, you know, collaborating is better than competing, you know, and I don't see any competition with any of those local medias because the reality, I have 300 people in Brazil that read my publication. I would like to have 10,000, you know, if I can find a partner local that will make it more relevant with the local language, with the local distribution and make it available even through this uh, kind of uh, uh, podcast so that people are aware of it. It's just good for me and it's good for Gregario and it allows us to elevate the quality of the content, uh, save on budgets instead of having 10 of us going to the same race, but go 10 of us in 10 different places and create 10 pieces of content. In, in the end, it's something that I think we see a trend in general media, even niche media companies and everything, that we see conglomerates. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Play Sports with Discovery and other big groups being formed. Um, so what you are trying to do to, to learn, that it tends to concentrate the, the content and the capacity to produce in In small small groups that being also in general media as well as in a niche media why do you think that this is um this is the way forward and not uh locally spaced uh, i companies? think uh, there's i mean I, I am a novice you know and i look at it from the eyes of someone who worked for an organization that uh, every night counted how much money was in the drawer and said if you don't have enough money today you're fired you know so for me it's my pnl was microsecond fast and every microsecond we knew whether we made money or not you know and i think i come from a perspective of looking at the economics and talking to people that were in the business before you know when passoni you know 20 years ago wanted to get the bicycle known by the japanese audience you would place a page of advertising on a japanese magazine for a year or two and it would cost you 15 20 000 euros for two years to be on that page now everyone thinks that having a Facebook account and posting through images of your cousin with your bicycle is equivalent. And sometimes it is, you know, sometimes those tools are very powerful. And so what happens is that the money available to the old media has compressed exponentially, exponentially. No? So if you work the way you work before and you had the publication of an Italian cycling magazine, they used to get 100,000 copies, was the only way people knew results. Which team, you know, every year I would buy the magazine that would publish which team has which athlete. What are the dates for the races? You know, when am I going to be going to the Alps this summer in May when the Giro is coming? Now everything is available at your fingertip. In uh, You ask ChatGPT and it will write you a 15 pages document on it. No, And so... Because of that compression, we need to become more and more and more efficient. And I do believe there are four or five media that want to cover cycling in every country in the world. And probably 80% of them two years from now will not exist anymore. Because the quality of what they do, the technology they use, the reach, it's just, it's just not, uh, not there. And so as you have tools, you know, you have two or three people in every country in this hub and spoke and you translate the content, we're so close to getting an algorithm to translate an article in any language in the world in a way which is so accurate, and the audio version of that article read by a bot which is trained on your voice, and it sounds like you as if you did it yourself. 
uh, what's mm-hmm. difficult is to be invited to have dinner with uh, Alain Philippe and have dinner with Alain Philippe's mother. I'm just using an example, which is not, uh, sure. but it happens every week with us. And then come back with the story of, we know them, we've known them for the last 15 years, we've been with them and with the sport director, and we're writing a story that no one has access to. And those athletes cannot meet the 30 journalists. And if they meet 30 journalists, they give you five minutes. And if you have a global reach, the brands and the readers, you can spend three days with them, create you know, a video with a drone riding around where they live and where they train, a podcast, a video interview, a photo shoot, a long form interview with him and his wife around the dinner table. And it's uh, and then once you spend that and you had that privilege, why not make it available through partnership like the one we want to do on a global scale? The one model that for me was broken is that some publication, many, licensed the title. No? So it's not that something I'm inventing myself. You know, there's the title, uh, they, you license it in a different country. When you do, the problem is that advertising digital is global. And so now if you start having a cycling publication in France, in Germany, in Italy, going to visit Pinarello and say, I would like to be paid to do a, a digital campaign, you start to having mm-hmm. license fees that compete with each other for advertising. And then mm-hmm. because everyone gets a thousand euros instead of someone getting 5,000 euros, the quality of that content is copy and paste of a press release and using the archive images that the brand gave you, which is not good for anyone that uh, Google sports, etc. So it's how do you create less content, less work for the brands, much, much higher quality that reaches a much bigger audience. And I think what's really important is to find the balance, which for ruler is almost too skewed to one side, where 75% of our revenues are readers. And that makes us operate with an integrity, which is second to none, because the advertisers, they come to us and they say, can you change an article? Can you do this? And we just never do. There's nothing that gets published in our publication, which is ever shared with the brands before. You know, sometimes they pay us to interview the founder of a company, but what we ask and what we publish is not edited because most of uh, how we pay our salaries is with the readers that want to pay for something which is independent, you know, and right now there's a lot of stuff which is not independent at all. Mm. Especially- It's a very good point, because sometimes a magazine becomes a catalog and then it loses value, it loses credibility. It's it's bad for everyone. Or or, or most YouTubes or smaller channels, you say, yeah, but he's paid to, speak about this bike he's paid to speak about this is not as you said it's not genuine it's not a true story it's not and you uh, cannot do a review. if you're paid for you cannot do a review you know you cannot do a review and say this bike is great it's it's like you, but you can be paid because it costs you five thousand euro to five file to fly a crew to to italy with a video with a journalist with a photographer and then to spend uh, a week writing a long piece interview is very expensive and it's like and it's good for the brand but we want always 100 percent editorial independence and we never share with the brands uh, uh, what we publish matteo uh i must say that is a, a dream coming true first to to be in the ruler live last year to have the opportunity to meet with you and and simon uh which is somebody that I admire. I, I, I have the, the first edition of the, the Black uh, I don't know which number it is, but uh, it was in the first series also. Uh, I almost bought a Pasoni on my 50th anniversary. I decided to, to do myself, but I heard, unfortunately we didn't meet them because I heard that an investor had bought Pasoni and I was concerned that as a prejudice, that investor would just have this as a toy and destroy the true value of Pasoni. So I decided to have a Baum uh, custom made in Australia, uh, also titanium. Uh, but it's on my plans uh, to, to design and have my own Pasoni in the future. And uh, I think getting together and uh, uh, exchanging information, because there's a lot of authority and connections that 
you have been built with your team. But also there's a view that we as a, a company from South America are doing. So I think it's a mutual benefit uh, association, uh, but we are honored to be in commerce on your wheel uh, of Ruler and doing the Ruler content in Portuguese to increase the audience. And who knows what's going to come next? Uh, but it's a promising uh, relationship that we are very, very honored to, to start officially. Oh, we're very excited too. And I think what you're doing is uh, super interesting to us. And I think you, you will add a lot of value to how we interact with our audience as well. So, uh, switching back to Portuguese, ouvinte e espectador de Gregário, fiquem nada, porque é, com a equipe do Mateu, uh, com o Rulé, Chimei, Passoni, uh, e a gente tendo uma relação mais próxima, tem muita coisa bacana vindo por aqui. Obrigado pela atenção de vocês. Algo só em interromper, né? A oportunidade, a oportunidade desse programa é justamente isso que o Mateu falou, de vocês a gente, no Brasil, vai ter acesso a algo que antes era único e que nós não poderíamos. E, e essa é a, a notícia mais legal dessa colaboração, que a gente vai poder trazer para vocês em português, com o nosso tempero, né? O, essa qualidade, esse conteúdo, esse acesso que, que o Matheus justamente falou, que eles têm as portas a, a serem abertas. E às vezes a gente é, não tem, não tinha ainda. Agora, se você ainda não conhece, vai lá, baixa o app da Ruler. Uh, primeiro que eles têm um, um newsletter genial de textos fantásticos, de fotografias. E você pode comprar todas as edições uh, da Ruler que estão lá. Uh, esse é o benefício no seu celular, no seu tablet. Uh, e as edições futuras, a gente vai fazer alguns programas uh, usando a referência das matérias em português para que você conheça um pouco e queira conhecer ainda mais indo na edição inglesa, e quem sabe um dia a gente tem uma edição português da Rulé. Muita coisa pela frente. Matheus, muito, muito obrigado. Grazie mille. Muito obrigado. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to come and visit. Uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, we have to make it happen. A good bike ride uh, in Brazil. <laughs>